The mindset's key with a cancer patient because sometimes they just think this is it and they just wither. For the first couple of cycles, I'd still needed the Oxycontin, but I didn't need the anti-nausea and I didn't need the sleeping tablets. I then talked to my hematologist about it and he's weighing me each time. And he's going, look, you, you haven't lost any weight. This is rare. Before we came in here, I showed you and your son a picture mm -hmm. of you, which for people watching in the um, on YouTube, if you're kind enough, I'll share with them to show oh, a bit of a before, photo, Richard. Yeah. a before and after <laughs> shot. Because I've you've always yeah. been in good shape when yeah. I've known you. I mean, yeah. you know, you're a sort of shaved head man in his forties, style. You've always been, you know, you've always worked out. You've always been in pretty good shape. And the, I, I don't know. I was looking at that picture of you what, thirteen years ago, and mm. I can barely recognise you. Mm. And it's not about you know. There's there's plenty of people fatter than that. You know, it's just a fairly probably mm. a fairly standard body type of sure. a, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. man in his thirties who'd concentrated on things other than keeping himself in shape, but. It's more. It's more than that. I think you've, you you sort mm. of express. It, you, what can you tell from one photo? Your expression looks different. What what, what do you see when you look at that picture? Yes, yeah, so it, it takes you back. Um, so at that time, so yeah, thirteen, maybe fourteen years ago, and my whole life's goals and direction were different. I, my, I took all my validation and success out of my corporate career with Specsavers, a company I love and, and, and really enjoyed. And so I worked for them all around the world and a lot of travel, a lot of business dinners, a lot of booze, a lot of, you know, just sedentary lifestyle, first meeting at 6 a.m., last one at midnight. And so everything was focused on corporate career and success. So then something's got to give on that. So it's usually health or it's relationships or, you know, generally uh, anything else it could do so my whole focus was on that corporate of which I just neglected health for the first time in my life and I grew up on the beaches of Australia surfing and playing rugby league and just on the bike the whole time and when I moved to London the first couple of years were okay and then I had winters of which everyone sort of starts eating fatty foods and you know I'm not used to cold and then combined with the corporate stuff I just got fat I didn't do any sport I didn't do any training and progressively when the notches of the belt come out or you go to get a new suit and the size is different you just think all right yeah no I'll, I'll get on a diet next week next month um, or I go back in the gym and lift weights for about six seven weeks and then I just didn't do enough for change because now I'm flying here I'm flying there I'm jet lagged I'm not jet lagged I'm so tired and, and, and so you get in this perpetual lifestyle of just taking your self-worth out of work and success in in the career um, and that was interesting and, and the big catalyst for me was um, my son because I thought right I'm now going to be a dad and so that's when I walked into an MMA gym for the first time in the worst physical condition of my life and then right I'm going to learn how to fight properly i'm going to do muay thai i'm going to do jiu-jitsu and i'm going to train with pro fighters and from that i just sort of suffered all the way through into good health so to speak so you got yourself in decent shape at that point but yeah sort of reversing trends so then i stopped the booze for a little bit and then the sugar and then i sort of learnt about obviously the sugar effect in carbohydrate as opposed to fat because you know the misconception with the food pyramid was fat was bad and you know carbohydrate was good and you know, they all serve different purposes but i was on the carbohydrate cycle of eating every couple of hours so learning then that fat was good and doing intermittent fasting was the one that really worked for me i tried keto i tried the five and two but that then the weight just stripped off combined with high intensity training and then you build momentum and then I fell in love with jiu-jitsu. I fell in love with Muay Thai. I used to train in Thailand a bit. And then I would just sort of you know, want to be better at that. So my whole focus shifted to martial arts. And how long, how long, so how long between starting that 
getting in decent shape and then it all going wrong again yeah so it was probably a two-year span of reversing from that obese photo to getting in decent shape you know still corporate career but i'm just not eating dessert at the dinners i'm not drinking the wine at the dinners and 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 trying to train a little bit in the mornings and evenings um and then the bombshell came and i got a sore back that just wouldn't get any better and i thought it was a disc issue and the lumbar spine from rolling jiu-jitsu and doing kickboxing um and harry my best friend and business partner is also a medical professor after a while of this i'm trying to do rehab and various things thinking it's a rugby issue that i've just obviously made worse with jujitsu he forced me to get an mri and uh i went in there thinking right definite disc and and halfway through you know you got the magnetic pulses and and all the noise halfway through they pulled me out i was oh shit that, that was a little quicker than usual and the guy come over and said, oh, look, I just need to inject a trace element in you. Um, it's just, it's nothing harmful. Are you allergic to anything? I was like, no, no, no. So he, he did an injection, then slid me back in. And that's when I knew everything's changed. Because so I'm like, why would he do that? He never asked for that. What's there? And then there was probably another 10 minutes of all the bang, bang, all the noise in an MRI. And I was just clear that I got cancer before he even said anything it was just straight away it was almost this clear thing so i'm then going into problem mode all oh, right what does it mean i've got these businesses open i've got this happening i'm supposed to go here and and then when he slid me out um i said oh okay everything all right he said yeah yeah look i'm just preparing a report um you know you go to your gp i was like oh okay um how long like, will it take he goes oh, i'm doing it now i suggest you go to your gp now straight away yeah, it's like it's not oh. good is it but i said to him can you tell me anything you say oh sorry i can't tell you anything but if you go to gp you'll be all ready and it was about a 15 minute drive from that mri to the gp and i'm just driving and it was almost zen like because now i've got cancer no one's told me but i know it is and before he obviously when you go, you've got to go that right now that's a bad time but you said you knew before was it how he was behaving or just it, uh, the, you had a you had a feeling yeah so look i'd always had an issue with the lumbar spine from rugby and then i'm doing jujitsu and and kickboxing and mma wrestling like, it's so bad on the lumbar so i perpetually had an issue and i usually rehab it out this one wasn't and then painkillers weren't working anymore that's when i got the mri i was just taking as many painkillers as i can and this is still excruciating i remember the day of i went and i was i was lifting weights that morning and i was just doing dumbbells on on a on a press machine i remember just sort of floating back to do it and i went through excruciating pain till i got there and then i lifted them up and then just dropped the dumbbells and just so i got up it was like a 10. so i knew something was not right um but i got to the gp and as I sort of walked in, I was just like, oh, yeah, I've, I've got to make an appointment. She goes, oh, yeah, Trent, no, they're waiting for you just in the other room. All bad and as signs, that happened yeah. in the GP, I'm normally dropping 20 they minutes. They know you by name. Oh, shit, he's here. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I just remember it so clearly because I was texting Harry. He was in Japan. He was doing a bike ride. And I text him saying, oh, listen, I've got an issue. And he's like, yeah, I'll talk to you in a couple of hours. I didn't tell him what it was. So I go into this GP. He then just says, look, they seen a tumor and I've, I've got it on the thing it's about a golf ball size on the base of your spine so what i've got to do is just have a look at you know what it could be i was like okay yeah and i was sort of, sort of numb a little bit and then he said uh okay so he just asked me a series of questions have you lost weight recently i was like yeah about a year or two ago but Oh, any change of diet i said huge change in diet huge change in lifestyle so he's okay what about strength and i was like i did a pb in deadlift two days ago i did this all through this pain um and i was training a lot and all of this so we went through it all then he looks and i've got quite light skin and, and he's like, all right melanoma and he starts sort of scanning me through doing all these tests lymph nodes the whole thing and i said so why why do you have to check all this out he said look i'm, I'm going to refer you to a hospital now but i've just got to go through screening because if there's a tumor on the spine and if it is cancer it's usually secondary because you know so there'll be a, something else um so he said look just go and grab a bag and go straight to the hospital and that was a bit like geez like two hours ago i was just going to mri and now i'm getting told to go to the hospital 
And then I text Harry just so I got to the hospital and then he called like, earlier than he was. He's like, what's going on? And I explained it all to him. He goes, okay, cool. Where are you now? I said, oh, they're just admitting me into a cancer ward. And he goes, oh, okay, right. All you can do now is just do whatever the doctors say and let us do, do our thing. Um, give me a call as soon as they admit you. Send me a screenshot of your chart. And so he was talking me through it the whole time. And then the doctors came and then they got me down and then they did a series of MRIs. Uh, the one the one that scared me more than most was the brain. They went, okay, yep, because we haven't found anything else, so we're just going to do the brain one. And that was probably about midnight. And so just waiting for that going, oh, man, that's the fear, brain cancer, because like, oh, at any stage I could just forget stuff or, or, or what. Um, and then... The next morning they came and gave all those results. We can't find anything else. We've checked your bloods. There's definitely something going on. We see the white blood count. Um, so we're just going to do a series of tests over the next few days. And then every six or eight hours, a team of three or four of them would come in and they'd just go through it. So you def definitely haven't lost any strength, your appetite. And I'm just like, no, no, this is the only symptom I've got is this our back. So generally they thought, look, you've probably got a weird little benign tumour um, and so we'll, we'll check it out. And then a consultant came in the next day from you know one of the major hospitals and he came down and then he just sort of said, oh, look, I'm a specialist in, in sarcoma. And I was like, oh, shit, what's, what's that? I haven't heard about that. So he sort of checked it all out and, and all my chart and then asked me a series of questions and then left. So I'm Googling sarcoma and it's the bad one. It's the one with surgery, but but really bad. So he just dropped that on you, left you alone yeah. with your phone to find out yeah. how bad it is. And nice. so I'm calling Harry. Oh, look, they suspect sarcoma. He's like, how can they suspect sarcoma? This I was like, they just sent a sarcoma guy to me. He's like, okay, look. Right, sarcoma so. guy always suspects sarcoma. I yeah. So, well, I mean, when his... you've got a hammer, all you see <laughs> is a nail, mate. Um, but so then Harry then sort of just started calling me a little bit, and I think he could judge uh, my anxiety. So he said, look, I'm going to move you to a hospital near me. I've got the best guy that you know even god would go to if he got a diagnosis i remember that and i was like all oh, right yeah send me send me jesus yeah yeah and so we, we end up doing that and I, I go and, and see this guy and he's going through my chart this is probably day four and going all right look because of this tumor i don't want to biopsy it normally we'll just come in just pull something out bang and it'll tell us what it is but if this is sarcoma that spreads right through the needle trace and we don't want that spreading so we're going to, over the next seven to ten days, do a series of tests to find out what this is. You know, they're on blood tests every day, and before this I was just skittish on needles. And then they came into a bone marrow thing where you know, that was pretty tough. And then just various things, they'd take just samples of different parts of the body, and then two or three days, right, it's not that. So they're going through process of elimination. Then Harry come back from Japan, and he comes in, he's like, okay, you know, he's chatting to them and talking to me he's going all right so look they've ruled out a few things but it's all speculation until we can biopsy it but they said now they're comfortable biopsying it and i was like okay cool and so they then put a needle in take this the sample and probably two days later the the, the doctor that i was under care called me up he was on holidays he goes well, i just got your, your your results through i've told him to call me you know i know you're a friend of harry's uh, i'll give you a call myself there's good news and bad news. The bad news is you've got cancer. The good news is it's lymphoma. And, you know, given your age, given all that sort of stuff, very high success rate with, with uh, treatment. And it sort of stunned me a little bit. I was like, okay, but there's good news here, right? This is the one that they sort of want. Um, and then he said, oh, there's a hematologist coming up. He'll chat you through the chemo stuff. And then the, the word chemo just sort of really rocked me a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay, so I've got to do chemo. Um, and so then a hematologist comes in, Harry comes up, and they're just explaining what it is. And, you know, all I knew with that was breaking bad previously. And you'd see people wasting away from cancer. So that, that was a fear. Um, after I got the schedule, which is going to be every three weeks, the, 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 lymph, the lymphoma treatment we use is called R-CHOP, which is uh, essentially um, something that's been used for 20 years and very good for uh, you know, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which I had, uh, diffuse B cell. I just remember that delineation. And so then I was let out of the hospital. At, at that stage, I was on pretty strong painkillers. So I was on endone every three or four hours, but then the pain was so much because this thing's growing right on my nerve and the S1 and sacrum. 
as well. Uh, so then the pharmacist in the hospital come and said, because we're going to admit you now, we can't give you all this endone, so, so we're going to give you Oxycontin. Personal and that was a, a bit personal like, favourite. Oh, and this is 10, 10, 12 years ago. So this is the height of Oxycontin content issues over in the US. I said, no, I don't want that. don't want that. She goes, why not? I was like, well, because I'm just worried about getting off it. She goes, look, what, you're in a lot of pain. You're going to wake up every three hours and have to take these endone. This is the same thing as your slow release. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then I, I started, uh, so I would have had three months on, uh, on, on Oxy through the first couple of levels of, of uh, uh, chemo. So, yeah, so fear was unknown. Fear was, okay, here I am. I've now fought back to good, fit, uh, good fitness. I love jiu-jitsu. I love MMA. I love martial arts. Now I've got to stop all that because the big problem with, uh, obviously chemotherapy is that you just poison yourself and you kill your immune system and then your body builds back up after three weeks and then you poison yourself again with the intent of poisoning obviously the growth of the of the cancer and so it's just this whole thing of understanding all right so you go through this and the way i describe it is the first one was the worst i was hallucinating and, and all over the shop and then after a while it's just like a big heavy booze binge like a three-day hangover where you're tired you feel dehydrated you feel terrible but with no fun bit right just with no fun no bit. fun just no. just the just the horrendous hangover yeah and 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 you know the process as well so each time we would do a cycle it'd be about eight hours i'm sitting in a hematology clinic and you're sitting around with lots of older people doing various blood transfusions or, or treatments and iron and then some cancer people uh, and then they come and they put one bag on you for you know an hour and then they come and change that as all these little beeps going off so in that time i'm working i'm reading i'm you know watching videos just just trying to research cancer and how can i have got this um and then the worst part was there was the second last bag of the day It'd be after lunch they'd come in the nurses would put all this gear on, like a mask, all this stuff, big heavy gloves, and they'd go and get this, almost like a flask, and they'd bring that out and they'd pop it down, all so careful with lifting this bag up, putting it there, and then they're just mainlining that into my into my bloodstream. So I'm like, she is so worried about touching mm. the outer bag, and this is coming straight in. And every time they would just release that one, it'd just be a chill, like it would always be freezing cold. Um, and I never really looked at, into what those drugs were. I was just like, just get this done. But that was the, the hardest point of every chemo cycle was just when that one come in. So what's your mental state like? Because, you know, you, you've finally done the right thing. You've got yourself in shape. And then this happens. You must be feeling like, oh, f you know, I don't know. What, not, yeah. the, not, not, not why did I bother, but. Hmm. I don't know. What, what, what's your, what's I, your I, mind I go at that kept point? kept a, a video diary, uh, which I, it's hard for me to look at. I still don't really look at it much. Mainly lessons for my son. I'm talking through my chemo treatment when after the second one when my hair started falling out. You know, so I, I thought, look, I want to document something if it doesn't go well. You know, I want to leave something for, for, for my boy and just explaining what life is. So he's a baby at this point. He's a about one and a half, one yeah, and a half, okay. at, at this stage. So I got in shape when he, when, when, uh, just when we were pregnant oh, yeah, with him, yeah, and then yeah, years, yeah. So the timeline uh, is, is about that bit. So it was all this sort of a bit cathartic, but also was part of the mindset was just to really understand and document. And I describe what I feel like. I describe you know all of this. But you have been back and looked a bit. Yeah, I've, I've glanced. It? It's it's pretty hard. Is it hard? Is it just just looking at the state of yourself, or God, God, or does it bring the bring the pain back? Or? No, it shoots me straight back into that chair. Like it's a, it's a, really because I think it was such an emotive time. And so even though physically, and 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 we'll talk about what I did differently. Uh, the, the most chemo patients, but the mental side of it, I think I, I, I developed almost a steely resolve. Like, I, this is not going to beat me. And I never once thought this cancer will get me. But there was little elements of, okay, if it does, I'll do this every, but it won't. But if it does, I'll do this. And, you know, you get your affairs in order, you look at your will, you, you try to reflect on your life. And 
oddly enough, every time I would do that, I was happy. I, I was content. Like I, because you were taking steps. Sorry, because you. Well, no, I was content with my life. Oh, with what you're so when you when you're diagnosed, and when certainly the first round of chemo was just a mess. And I remember the first diary. I think the second day of it, I was just like, okay, I've got a child I've brought in this world. I've got a good moral compass. I'm ethically happy with how I've lived my life. I've got a great band of friends. I've had success in a career. I've been able to you know achieve a lot and travel the world. And, and there was something cathartic in that because, okay, if it does get me, well, you know, it hasn't been a ruined life. I didn't not achieve. And, and, and so that was part of the emotional um, management of it, I think. And, and then just trying to look at what could I do differently that other people don't do. And that, that was where the, the treatment plan for my chemo differed from, uh, I think, the normal way. So they offer you, like for the pain and stuff, they offer you like standard pharmaceutical range and you were thinking, I don't fancy... Yeah, it's a, it's a cocktail. And, and, and the way Harry described it is when I got issued with, all right, so you're going to start chemo on this day, so we need you in two days before and we're going to flush, I think it was prednisolone, maybe they put a steroid in, I, I can't really remember what that one... Metformin brings my... No, no, that's the, that's the other, other thing I looked at. So what they did is they give me a list and they say, okay, go to the pharmacist and, and you get this list. And I went, uh, oddly enough, to the pharmacy straight after the hematologist went in and I look at the back and I know that pharmacist. And just as I was bringing it up to her, I went to school with her and I hadn't seen her for mm, 10 years. And I seen her, she sort of, I think she looked at the name, looked up and she just sort of walked out to me and I was like, oh, whoa. She goes, hey, uh, yeah, a bit of bad news. I just remember just going, yeah. And she goes, don't worry, we'll, we'll get you right. And she says, we'll walk back. And I was like, so I had a lot of this. And I would call Harry, all right? They've now given me so many drugs. And I've got to take this one at this time. And I've got to take this for the pain. Then I've got to take this to offset that. And I've got something for sleep. Then on chemo days, I've got the anti-nausea and then something against the anti-nausea. And then I've got, you know, all these various drugs. And so I, I used to have them laid out and then you'd know which time. And so I did that for the first round of chemo and my brother helped me around because when I did all the all the transfusions and all, all the all the stuff I felt all right. I drove home and then bang it hit me. I started hallucinating. I was throwing up and then so my brother called Harry. Harry wrote a script for a different anti nausea a different pathway. So my brother goes and gets that that one settled me down a little bit more. And and then I was just taking all this all these drugs and it was just you know, up and down all, all the time. So emotionally it was tough. Um, but I started looking at it all and then I'd research each drug and look at it and, uh, you know, it's all bad news, so to speak. So then I had a friend uh, that was an ambulance uh, officer. And the problem with having chemo is your immune system drops. You can't go and socialise, you can't go and see people. If you catch a common cold, it can turn into pneumonia and kill you in a couple of weeks. So they, they make that real clear hang at home if you want to do some exercise just a light walk along the beach in the morning don't come into contact with people uh, and if someone comes around your house just have the hand sanitizer before they come in this is before COVID. yes i was thinking oh, yeah. it's like your own lockdown yeah which yeah. is it's not going to help your um you know your mental state is it no so i looked at it and said oh, right this is brutal what can i do differently and so there was two things that stood out so one of them is I was physically active and I'd just gone through the momentum of getting in shape again and I'm fearing that I'm going to waste away so I was like okay I need to I need to get this from two angles I need some resistance training so I need to keep the muscles obviously building and and I need to keep eating so that were the two big issues with chemotherapy like the hangover you don't want to eat so that's that's why I was chatting to Harry and chatting to a few friends about it all. And and my friend, the ambulance officer, um, came around one day and and called me and said, "Look, I've just left something outside your door." And I, I opened the door, and and there's a bit of weed, a bit of you know, cannabis. And at that stage, I was I was looking at researching the CBD, l looking at all this stuff. And look, cannabis we've all tried in our life. And at university, you'd have a little bit and. Um, I called him up. I'm saying, well, all right, time to party. And he's like, no, look, this is what 
most people, if, if they're open to it, this is what gets them through because if you have it every night, you'll be hungry and you'll eat and you'll probably sleep so you don't need the sleeping drugs and your mm, anti-nausea might be all right, bang, bang, bang. So that sort of set, that was a clear little crossroad in my life because it made me look at, okay, there's a plant alternative to the other stuff. And over the next four rounds of chemo, I would progressively take cannabis and I would reduce one or two other drugs. And then, so I didn't need the sleep issue. And then the biggest thing is I'd have cannabis and I would eat. I'd have a pizza, or I'd make tacos, or I'd make fajitas, then I'd have ice cream. And, and, and all of this would then obviously you know, stop me wasting away. But I'd sleep so good, I would then train in the mornings. And the, the problem was, as I said about, obviously, your immune system down. I can't go into a commercial gym. I couldn't do martial arts. I couldn't do kickboxing. I couldn't go into a normal gym. So I called up. Opposite me was a 24-hour gym. And I called up them, got to the owners and said, look, this is my story, right? I, I want to train. I need resistance training. I've got some stuff here. It's not enough. And they said, look, the cleaners start at 4.30 till about 5.30, they do the back of the gym forward. So why don't you get there at five and then sort of go through the cleaning? You know, we'll tell them that you're fine, you're, you got the membership. And, and so that's what I did. So I'd go in the mornings, I've slept well, I'd get up, the alarm would go, I had this positivity and I'd go and do a couple of supersets. I'd only last 25, 30 minutes and then I'd just feel really sort of um, uh, lethargic. So then I'd go back home, but then I'd cook some breakfast. I had this mindset that was cool, so I'd cook a nice sort of, a lot of the times it was eggs Florentine, was, was this little pattern I got into, you know, poaching them, getting them all right. And then what would happen then throughout the day is I wouldn't need the other drugs. So I'd still take, uh, at, at the for the first couple of cycles, I'd still needed the Oxycontin because I was in a lot of pain when, that, when, when I'd stop that. But I didn't need the anti-nausea, and then I didn't need the sleeping tablets, and I didn't need the, the offset of the benzo sleeping tablets, and I didn't need... And so chatting with Harry and, and, and about it all, just to make sure I'm not doing anything wrong. And he's saying, look, the mindset's key here. You know, you're seeing, you're, you're behaving as if, you, if, as if you're overcoming it. And the mindset's key with a cancer patient, because sometimes they just think this is it, and they just, you know, wither. And this is the power of the brain that, 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 that I been fascinated by and so after uh the second and third cycle i then talked to my hematologist about it i said look i'm not taking all these i'm turning up doing this doing that doing that and he's weighing me each time and he's going look you, you haven't lost any weight this is rare and i said well look i know you told me to walk on the beach but i'm actually lifting weights three times a week but this is what i'm doing to prevent it you know, to prevent germs and understanding that. And what I'm doing is having cannabis, I'm having CBD, I'm having curcumin, I'm having omega fatty acids, all this stuff from plants, and then I'm having THC in the, in the evening. And he was going, okay. And I sort of said, thoughts or whatever. He said, look, I can't really comment on anything because it's what, you know, THC is illegal. But, you know, I, I understand why you, you do it, I hear good things. I said, so is there any way of, like, you know, like, how do I get your medical opinion? He said, look, I can't. I, I, I'm, I can't really give a medical opinion because these are, you know, drugs that are uh, not allowed on this regime. And I said, doesn't that bother you? And he just sort of sat up from the desk because he was going to the next patient and just sort of turned and he just like, well, one day the truth will come out. And there was something about that, like I just left, I got in the car and I drove home and called Harry. I'm like, look, this is what happened. And he goes, look, this, this is the problem that we have as medical practitioners. We will hear a lot of good stories like that, but we can only prescribe things that are actually allowed to be prescribed. And if we give an opinion on something that, that doesn't have all the research, that, that's not our medical opinion. So what he said was right. Some people will just have an apples diet and feel amazing. And then all of a sudden, you know, I can't go around and tell every patient just eat apples and, and, and you're going to be incredible. But so, so we put it in context for me. And I'm always quick to tell people that, you know, curcumin or cannabis or CBD, none of that cured my cancer. Chemotherapy did. It killed that, that 
real problem cell. And then radiation I had after that. That's what killed the cancer. But the natural way made it easier for me. It made me feel a little bit better. Right? I'm not taking this massive laundry list of, of prescription drugs. And for people that I've helped through cancer before, because you know, part of getting through it is you're in this little community and I hear of anyone, a friend of a friend, whatever, look, give me my number, let me try to call them. And you talk through, there's this little community of when you come out the other end and, and I'll, never, I'll never tell them what I did. If they ask, I will just explain it because everyone's in a different little world and, and, and have a different viewpoint. But the biggest thing I push is mindset, you know, just trying to, you're going to beat it. It's annoying and it's disruptive and, yeah, there's going to be bad days, but you are going to beat it. And if you think like that, it tends to happen. Yeah, because you've, no you've no way of knowing, but suppose you hadn't, you know, taken it upon yourself to alter what you were taking and forced yourself to exercise. You don't know how much you could have gone to the bad in that time. You know, I mean, maybe you'd have been fine and just a bit thinner and... Yep. Hard, have hard work to go back but it could have been up to and including the worst result you know if you'd just gone on the slide then you know if you'd if you'd given up yeah or or if i just strictly did what was told under guidelines uh, but I, i'm not that sort of guy i'll look at my own research and and this then massive shift in my life right so from corporate to now understanding right look let's look at natural plant medicine let's look at some things that are grown on the earth that can actually help us here and that some of them can be studied some can't so the best thing i had again a best friend and business partner has a phd in visual neuroscience and nutrition and body weight and a medical degree and the big thing is Harry had the same cancer as me three years before. So I had a sequence of things that set me up just out of pure luck. So I sort of then added research to that and passion and, and, and a real focus on natural healthy living. And I changed my life completely away from that corporate career, looking at two things I wanted to keep going that worked for me during cancer. One, I need to keep training and learning skills and keeping the body developing as I age. So I started a martial arts gym, Elevate above Richmond train station. And that was, I was still in remission when I started that, but it was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to teach martial arts. I want to do martial arts and I want my kids to learn martial arts. And the second thing I did is I pivoted out of corporate and I went into bioscience. I, we've We've got a, a lab in Twickenham where we innovate all the plant compounds to understand effects on how we can naturally help some of our human challenges. What's the, what's the roughly the time period between um, finding out about the cancer and was there a day when you thought, I don't know, because you don't, it's not like on the telly where you go, you're cancer free now, it doesn't work like that, but do you have, do, yeah. is there a meeting where you sort of felt yeah, it's all so be okay now. the pivotal time was when I got off OxyContin. That was after the fourth chemo cycle, I got off OxyContin. That was a huge thing. So how long is that since diagnosis? So they were, they were three okay. week cycles, so four, so that's 12 weeks of the start of chemo, which would have been probably three weeks from the MRI. So we're saying probably 15 weeks into diagnosis to halfway through chemo. And I got a PET scan. Um, so it's sort of like a MRI, except they they inject you with a little um, bit of, uh, I can't remember how they term it, but it, it's sort of like it's a nuclear molecule. So it's like, oh shit, what, what's that? And they inject glucose and this sort of nuclear molecule that lights up under, under light. And you go there and they said, right, we need you to lie back for 45 minutes just listen to a podcast or an audio book. We can't have you reading because you're going to use your bicep to hold that up. We don't want you moving any muscle. We're going to inject this in and the glucose will take this sort of element to the fastest growing thing in your body, which is the tumour. 
and and subsequently you know, a lot of work on uh, keto keto diets and low sugar diets because of the glucose is just you know, obviously builds the the, the tumor that, that was the, the theory so i'm laying back i do that then they take me into an mri when they come out they said it's gone right so the the, the tumor is gone you can't see it anywhere in your body so the chemo has killed it but you got to do another three cycle or it might have been another two cycles of chemo and then you're doing 20 shots of radiation just to make sure that we get this area and it was that day I was I was driving home going okay so it's gone now but there's a big tail on it the first 12 months it can come back I still haven't finished treatment so I've got to look at prevention and then there's a five-year remission and it's sort of like you know the, the tail of the last four or five years don't get it now past I've been out of remission for probably five years if I get it again it's a whole new one right so so it means it wasn't uh, the, the, the linked one so that day I went home and I remember chatting to Harry and go all right I've got no tumor I don't need these pain tablets the oxys were because this tumor was on the spinal cord I remember saying how do I get off them he goes look you've got an iron will you get off them by just not taking them and there was a thing where I was like, okay, I'll keep them there. And I, I, I had them aside and I just went, right, tonight I won't do it. I had some cannabis that night. Just going, all right, so I don't need pain. And then we'll find there's no tumor. So again, the power of the brain. I know there's no tumor. That's why I needed the pain because the tumor was 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 in that nerve ending. And the next morning I woke up and I remember, oh, okay, what should I be feeling? I did the training session. I came out. And, and I didn't feel I needed it. I didn't feel anything. And I was worried about how do I get off this because people get addicted to it. And then that night, I remember calling Harry again going, look, I'm not feeling any withdrawals. He goes, that's good. I go, but look, it's apparently it's really highly addictive and all that. And then he explained something about a sink and said, look, because you had so much pain, this tops up just to get normal. The problem with oxy is people take it when they don't have pain, the sink overflows. They get this feeling that they want, this high that's hard to get rid of you just had it to mask pain and straight away i was like boom and i've never ever felt one withdrawal from that stage it must have been say three cycles so so it was probably 10 weeks maybe 12 weeks of oxy i just no withdrawal it. nothing see the rest of us need do a doctor like harry this is the thing because i i was on oxy content and said to my gp like you i've got i want to stop this stuff and he was like, "Oh, easy there. Don't go. Don't don't make any rash decisions." Mm -hmm. Wrote as I was saying this, he wrote me a prescription for a hundred more tablets or whatever it was, and handed over and mm -hmm. and fucked off before. I did. Yeah. That was my medical advice. Just keep taking it. Just yeah, keep yeah. taking it. And I I thought, "Fuck it." And I just stopped literally one day. I was at dinner. I thought, "Right, I'm stopping this stuff." And had one hor horrific. Because I'd probably been it for a bit longer had one horrific night where I s sat up all night feeling just awful mm. but then the next morning was like oh, I could just sort of feel the the clouds yeah, parting right. you know it was really it was really weird although I still felt shit and didn't feel great for a couple of days mm -hmm. the feeling of just emerging from that fog of that horrible medication mm. which I think by the way is good for if you're you know in in the hospital post-operative all that sort of thing oh you need it you need it yeah um because other things don't work and if, if you're well. in immense pain you can't heal right? so, yeah so so it's great for that but but not for not for just ongoing basis no it's and crazy. i think now i think the medical profession they've seen a lot of this stuff obviously it's been exposed that they don't they're not effective and they're highly addictive and and so you know recreationally people are chomping them and, and and having massive issues and huge deaths so I, I think the medical profession's looking for alternatives as well and certainly this is what professionally we've focused on because after chemo i did 20 shots of radiation and i'm you know laugh with some friends that are all tatted up i've never had tattoos but i've got three little tattoo dots on me one each hip and one right in the center and that was because in radiation they come and they put you in this certain position because it was obviously the base of my spine and the, the, the radiation machine's got to hit that same spot each time just cauterizing it and radiation to me wasn't a bad 
experience because I had a little bit of skin discomfort but I never really had the burns or, or, or the issues of that but the first shot of radiation I went in I obviously previously met the specialist then I turned up for that one where they they gave me these these little tattoos and they're lining it up and the disclaimer form was something I'll never forget <laughs> Where he's going through, okay, look, we need to go through the, 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 the issues here. This is why we're doing it because of obviously your non Hodge lymphoma. We're going to target that exact area. But we do have to tell you that this radiation may cause cancer. <laughs> and I was, I'm looking at him, he's smiling, I'm smiling because he's had this conversation with every patient. I'm going, I've already got it, right? So, so, so that that's the thing. Would it so, add just to the cancer that. I've already got, or would it give me a different one? I don't Chop know. me How up with a work? new one. But it was it was one of these things where I looked at it and I was like, okay, yeah, look, I'm fine with that, mate. Yeah, you know, the doctors will agree. And then the next bit, it was going, okay, and you will probably have continual nerve damage to this area, you know, indefinitely. I wish he never said that. I wish I, I could just read it. I would have half read it and ticked the box. But he said that and implanted in my in my brain. I, I've got, I'm going to have permanent nerve damage. At that stage, I was off the oxys. I had no pain because the tumor was gone. So I'm feeling all right. And then you know they staggered those every week, um, and and so I, I'd, I'd have these shots. And subsequently, I I then got all clear and 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 you know basically then are in remission. And all, th well, I get back in the jujitsu gym. I start kickboxing again, and then every couple of months, boom, you know, maybe I was in a triangle. Someone stacked me, and boom, my, my back sore the next day. I'd be like, oh no, is that cancer? That was always the thing. Oh shit, is that cancer? And subsequently, because of the sport that I do, I have these flare-ups once a year, where maybe I'm deadlifting, and then I'll, I'll roll jujitsu afterwards, and it's a bit too tight, a tight psoas, the hip flexors. And then I usually go through a little routine of trying to sort of firstly stop for a little bit, do some stretches, loads of yoga and all that, and it usually gets me through. And every now and again, it's probably happened three times in, in, in remission where the normal rehab doesn't work. And then I go straight for an MRI just, just to rule it out. It's the exact same area as pulsating. And so now I've studied a lot of the, the neural link with pain. And, you know, you and I have spoken about this a lot with one of the pain scientists and Laura Mosley and all of this understanding what pain is. Um, so I knew I have to treat this and I don't want to use opioids. I don't want to use the non-steroidal stuff. Ibuprofen I use way too much. And that's when we're focused my whole business, my whole career is on natural pain and inflammation management. And that's when we come up with curcumin. It was the best compound in all the world science on a huge hockey stick of growth. But we couldn't get it in the body. It's just naturally not something the body absorbs because it's a crystal. It doesn't dissolve in water. It doesn't dissolve in oil. So over the last four years, we have researched all the ways on how we can keep this plant-based and get it into our body and we cracked that chemistry a year ago we've developed these micelles out of plants which are small sort of lipids or fats and we're getting that in the body and now this we really pushed everything in on this new brand this new concept delicious flavors and that's where we're focusing on my whole career now is about kirk that's my big brand of natural pain and inflammation management so for clarity's sake, what curcumin is supposed to do when people are taking it, but you're saying doesn't work because it's not absorbed by the body, it's 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 generalized reduction of inflammation. Is that what is that yeah. what the effect you're hoping for? So, so so there's a few pathways that affect inflammation. So if it's acute, if you roll your ankle or twist your shoulder and then you get that swelling, your body's sending fluid and, and blood to the area to immobilize, stop stop this because there's tissue damage curcumin's not that good at that that is where ibuprofen and non-steroidals are very good the acute bit you take that when you take a, an ibuprofen it basically gets in your bloodstream and it just runs through all your bloodstream turning little switches on and off to alleviate the pain the fever is the same pathway that's why it's really good with fever now after three or four days with the average brained ankle the tissues are healed but your inflammation will stay another week or two. 
Again, just trying to prevent and, and, and do it. Then you move, the inflammation becomes what they call dysregulated inflammation, DYS. And that's the inflammation that's not helpful. So this can occur in eczema and various sort of things people have um, that the body is trying to send inflammation because they see it's a threat and the threat is already gone or it's not there. So dysregulated inflammation or chronic inflammation, which is behind a lot of the chronic pain, that's where curcumin really hurt, helps with. Okay. And yeah, because a, a doctor explained this to me very well, and he, it, psoriasis was the example mm -hmm. he used because it's a very obvious one, and, and, and it works it works to, to think of it as inflammation because you're actually seeing something that's red and inflamed, but um, that's a, it's an obvious physical one. But it's, it's well, there's a growing body of, of medical opinion that it's behind pretty much everything. You know, there's, yeah. a, there's inflammation causing all kinds of things. Uh, this, this guy, uh, Professor Bullmore, he wrote a book on it and he, about whether it's behind depression this was a particular mm. focus for him but the more the more people look at it and a lot of doctors are uh, cautious about this because it kind of it kind of pisses on what they're specifically trying to do in their particular part of the body or mind be because they're saying reduce inflammation overall you'll improve all you know overall health and, and it's and it can be the trigger for pretty much pretty much anything going wrong in the body can be triggered by inflammation and it sort of sounds yeah. too simple yeah to be true because we want there to be clever um fi clever fixes for things but well, yeah we want our body to work well and so one of the things you, you mentioned so inflammation is a root cause of multiple health issues that's not in question what's in question is how you treat it so we we see a massive rise even in this country with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory ibuprofen now, I'm in the martial arts community. We see it all the time. People popping that every day after training to sleep that night because you've been doing chokes or you're carrying an injury. You're seeing rising awareness in the press with people who are doing the marathon for the first time. So they're taking ibuprofen every day because they're a little bit sore every day. And what we're now seeing is massive bodies of research. The NHS are looking into the, the, the ibuprofen epidemic here because we're all taking it more than we should. So one of the key elements here is why are we taking it is because we feel a little bit sore. Now, that's a different pathway to the acute inflammation where you've just really hurt yourself. We're taking something that, help, that, that is designed to deal with acute sort of you know, traumatic inflammation. And we're trying to use that treatment for the chronic stuff or the dysregulated or the overactive inflammation. And so a lot of the ways it can be classed as sort of a problem with your immune system. It's just sending inflammation there. Now, our, f our focus has always been cancer prevention, but I always tell everyone chemotherapy and radiation cured my cancer. But we've looked at prevention and curcumin is easily the most promising compound in world science for that. So we extract it cleanly, we only deal with plants, and now we've set up a big production facility where we can get it into the body. Now, we never market that cancer. That's our own personal project for me and Harry. We had cancer, we don't want it again. So we don't smoke. We try to really sort of reduce our risk, and then that's the, the, the form of it. When we started taking it for that, we were noticing I didn't need ibuprofen for my jiu-jitsu. Harry's a competitive cyclist. He didn't need it for recovery. He's also got Crohn's disease, a terrible sort of inflammatory bowel disease. Once we go through so many iterations, bang, he's, his health is the best he's ever had as he ages. And he's a medical professor. This guy's got five degrees in medicine and science. And now, right, we have now created the drink that we're really, really proud of. The toughest thing is how do we explain that to people fairly? And what we've always had this ethos is, okay, we'll let people try this. If they don't want it, give them the money back. It doesn't work. We're not commercially trying to just push stuff down and then not stand by it. And so over the years of four years of research and development, we've got one that we're really, really proud of. But it can't fix everyone for everything. It's impossible. We, we don't want to do that. What we want to do is say, if, you, if it works for you, you know, it, it works for me because I need something. 
I know I'm going to have constant bouts of this nerve damage, whether it's neural or whether obviously I've got disc issues and I've had sciatic issues, but I'm not stopping jujitsu. So I've got to look at something naturally to help me with that. And that's what we're finding. So we were, we've found extensive research on chronic arthritis people. So osteoarthritis is our biggest cohort. Now with the Crohn's and colitis, we're doing a lot of tests. And we've just now started getting into the sport recovery. So we've got some, some combat athletes, we've got some cyclists going through all this. And then that's the, the whole idea is if we can stop popping the ibuprofen, we can reduce the issues with ibuprofen so it's not just stomach ulcers it's massive kidney and liver damage but five years ago it was safe you know this is yep. a thing this is i mean 10 years ago maybe it was it was a perfectly safe thing to take and, and people... it's still safe under the right conditions 48 hours 72 hours max but then stop it because it restricts blood flow to the organs and and that's the issue yeah, I mean, it's it sort of makes sense that sh that taking something continually, that shutting down something which is meant to do you good. Yep. It's gonna ha there's gonna be some kickback, isn't there? Because you know you're shutting down a system that you need in most circumstances. Right? Look, there's a big rise in healthy living. So you know, plant based. You know, I, I'm 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 I go between. I'm eighty percent vegetarian. 20% sort of nice lean it now? meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I fast, and I like when I fast, I'll only have coffee and water. And then I do lots of regimes that we're on with testing things, vitamin D or, or curcumin. And so I then, you know, go through a, a battery of tests measuring sleep. And that's what we're getting a massive improvement on. But we got it when we're doing the dose every 12 hours because we're doing it every 24 and then we've got a half-life of eight hours and it starts dropping. And then by doing it every 12, we've got curcuminoids in the bloodstream as we sleep. With the aura ring and the whoop, the scores are going off the charts with everyone we're doing. And so I was saying, Harry, what's the hypothesis there? How can it be helping sleep? So he goes, look, this is a hypothesis. I haven't proven this. But what I think is the body feels more comfortable in less sort of chronic pain we don't have any you know, reduced organ damage. We're not taking ibuprofen. And when the body feels better, you're less inclined to move overnight. So your RAM will go deeper and yet you understand it because you're not, not, like, not feeling that well when you're sort of moving around. Because the sleep scores are undeniable. We're, we're now trying to set something up to, to have, have a real uh, relationship with some of these wearable gadgets where we're going, okay, look at what we're finding anecdotally let, let's let's pour some research into this uh, so that's what we look to do how can we try to solve some real human challenges and how can we do it naturally I, you'll probably know you've made a success of it when someone tries to copy your methods is that yeah that uh, happen look i'm sure it will happen um we spent four years on this and thousands of customers and so much research i'm sure people will copy but looks as long as the end result is people are getting natural natural help we might just be a stepping stone on someone else's research project and if they bring something better i'll try to work with them or take theirs like this is not about us conquering the world this is about progressing in natural treatments and that's the something that it's our personal projects as we age. We're now looking at mitochondria and looking at longevity and looking at effects of that. This is a lifelong project of mine. Cancer just shifted me from corporate into natural health and why I need to supplement that with um, hardship, which is jujitsu. Suffering, daily suffering. I need daily suffering. I need delayed gratification. I need to train when I don't want to train. And I need to get that black belt. Do you still have the the doubting voice in your head? Like, you know, like if you if you look out, the, it's cold outside. You think I could just stay home and oh, look, watch yes. the TV and have a biscuit? Totally. And some days I take the biscuit and have TV. Mm. But one of the beauty... The, or one of the most beautiful things in jiu-jitsu is the camaraderie of the team. So I get all of my social uh, interactions in my gym with my friends. I'm training with my friends. We try to kill each other in a safe way. And that's where I get my social interaction. I don't go to the pubs of a night. 
and go out drinking to see my friends. I'm training with my friends during the day or at night or in the morning. And and so having built my life differently, where within a two mile radius of my house is my bioscience lab and my gym, and now a charity that we're both involved in, Reorg, which helps military and first responders get into their communities better by learning martial arts and jiu-jitsu specifically. I want to ask you about the, the, the charity that you just mentioned because um, I'm, I'm speculating about how you were before we met but in, and you know again not going to read too much from your photo but was there a kind of selfishness to your life before you got ill would you say? Yeah I think I've always had an interest in charity and so I used to donate to quite a few funnily enough always the cancer research really? always. I don't know what it was I think you know I, I didn't have a family history of it but I was like oh there's always the fear I'll just contribute this and a little direct debit out and, and help them out um, so you weren't the selfish corporate monster that you might you might no and, might and look, try and paint you for I, th I think it gave me some sort of form of glee to say well I'm helping in some way because I'm focused over here on my corporate career and building wealth and so throwing a bit of money to them and if I can contribute in yeah. some way yeah and, and I always thought I'll go one day and dig a well somewhere I always thought I will take that time out go to a cause and then physically do something and improve it but there's just never enough time there's never enough uh, of a motivation to do it when you're in the rat race of corporate and career and mortgage and kids and, and all of that it's just never been possible so to have a charity that I spend my time helping and it's in the sport I love and it's with people that protect us it's a military police ambulance fire, fire brigade those guys are all keeping our community safe but not many people know a cop locally or they don't know a fire brigade they don't know an ambulance officer and they don't know anyone from the military that's the general public certainly for me yeah i mean i until doing martial arts and then getting involved with reorg as well talking to like policemen as far as I'm aware, unless I'd kind of, you know, happened to ta talk to someone didn't know they were one, I'd only talk to them in their, you know, in their professional capacity. Of course, or you meet one at a party and you're a cop, oh, okay, cool, and you yeah, just and you're automatically... you're backing off. Or, and military people, if you're not in that circle, I mean, I can remember, like, you know, one guy I hardly knew at school went and did it, and another sort of neighbour, and I talked to him, but basically didn't know anyone. in the, You know, and I live, I grew up, close to Aldershot which was at home of the British Army but you know I wasn't in that I wasn't that in that group. circle so you just don't you just don't know coppers and, well, and soldiers and if, if it's funny because those sort of cohort those professions they tend to have their whole social scene in that profession as well because I think what binds people in friendship and all of this is shared experience hmm. and we don't share the military experience, nor the police, nor that. We don't know what they go through. A lot of the times you look at an ambulance officer and helping someone, oh, what a noble person. But you don't really know what they do all the time. And then when you meet one, they tell you some of the stories of car accidents. You, oh, you're horrified. You meet some people in the military and you sort of know what it is, but you know you, you don't really know anyone into it and you just assume the worst. Then you meet them and start understanding their lives and you go, wow. Then you meet a police officer and go, oh my God, what a tough job. Then you meet a fire, a fire person. <laughs> then, firefighter. Then you meet That's a it. firefighter. <laughs> and the firefighters have got a very big range of job. A, you know, fire's very destructive, so they've got to be on the lookout for that, but they help out in all the other ways. And so what Reorg has been able to do as we go out and find the people in those communities, the military transitioning out or the police or the, or, or the firefighters or the ambulance, and then we try to give them a little path into learning martial arts. Because these people have self-selected and, and chosen such noble professions and they've been insulated in that with their, with their whole sort of social communities are within there. And if we can get them to go into a jiu-jitsu gym or a martial arts gym or a CrossFit box, they also have a mindset of hard training. They like 
PT, they call it physically tra physical training, or the police know they need to do combative stuff. And then when we place them in a gym as a reorg member, we give them all the kit and we want them to tell the reorg story in that gym. Now, having owned a gym, and then we have uh, reorg people that we donate memberships to, they then go and enrich the rest of the gym because they're all training with a police officer and they're all training with the military and all of a sudden they'll get comfortable and then they start learning a bit more about what do you guys actually do on deployment? Okay, how does it actually work? What are the struggles you guys have in life? And then we get this shared experience in a gym where it demystifies what a firefighter does or an ambulance officer or, or one of the military personnel, but it also gets them understanding different people as well so they're not just in this little closed group of people in their in their community and what we've then noticed is as people progress on so it's been a couple of years in this in, in my own gym these guys tend to stick in a lot more than other people so you start jujitsu the first six months brutal you get to the next six months less brutal and it's all on a brutal stage for, for a couple of years less and less but you start teaching others and the discipline that the military and the fire and the police and the ambulance services have is way better than the general public so those people tend to rise through up to bluebell and then they start going up to purple and sam the head of reorg the founder got to a black belt position which is one that we all revere how long do you reckon to you get yours we need to ask about that now I started grappling about 13 years ago. My goal is by the time I'm 50, so I've got four years. That was my goal too, um, but I'm closer to 50 than you. Yeah. Um, we're about the same point, so. Yeah. 52? I don't know. Well, it doesn't. I don't, it doesn't I, I, I matter. Don't really, I don't particularly care. Cause, you but know partly you're because you know it. The, the grade we are purple belt is decent it's what someone someone asked if, with sam actually and he said it purple's a professional grade well, so that's, yeah. yeah so you're in it for the long haul yeah so right? you already i mean my first my first jiu-jitsu instructor was a blue belt that's a long time you know because so yeah. like, that he was the he because there weren't many or many the senior sport people hadn't around isn't so the sport has been the fastest growing sport in most developed countries now year on year growth is incredible why because it's so tough it's so hard no one comes in the first time and they're good at it no one's good at jujitsu the first six months you've got to untrain what your intuition is because it's wrong and so then you've got to put yourself in these tough positions where you're tapping out so you've got to say oh i need to stop or i'm going to die and a smaller person's beating you continually and then you know we, we train mixed train with girls and they'll be better than you because you you know, even though you might outweigh them and, and maybe you're stronger to this person, technique will win every time. And the only time you can learn technique is time on the mats, constantly training technique. And so the discipline that we find with the military and the police and the fire and the ambulance services, they have more discipline than the average public. So that's why they will usually be really good training partners and usually progress well through jujitsu. Then you unlock the mental health benefits and look, we, we've all read stuff about people transitioning out of military, how hard it is for them, and, and, and some, unfortunately, uh, take quite drastic steps and, and really have a hard time of it. So what we try to then do, if you can get them a new focus and get them into a gym and get them in a hierarchy of belts and get them in a real structured program that you need to progress all this way, they're used to that. And they've got the camaraderie that they miss in the military. And so you combine that with now their social setting as they go to the gym rather than going to the pub. And the, the alcohol is a very bad drug for, for a lot of these people. So then you start to change lives. And we countless stories. You've interviewed many people that would talk about the massive change in life that reorg has helped facilitate with them to get into martial arts and then you hear the stories of the families and and then the communities are much better yeah one of them what was he said yeah one of the guys he he he'd sent a message thanking sam for for hooking him up with a jiu-jitsu gym and he said my daughter said she's got her dad back you know mm -hmm. and we're not talking about people that would maybe a bit of a grunt we're talking about i mean people that were quite close to killing themselves a lot of them you know yeah 
um, and and yeah, just a simple. I think I think when people get in those terrible situations, military or not, they can't see a way out. And just as simple a thing as today, instead of staying at home or doing whatever, going to the pub, whatever it is you do, you just go to this place and you don't know what you're going to find there. You might think, like I did, kickboxing clubs growing up were not friendly places. They were mm. places where you'd go in and everyone would be sort of looking at you. And yeah. it would be, they were aggressive places, so you wouldn't feel, you wouldn't be welcomed into them as a new no. person in the same way you are with jiu-jitsu where do you know what it's like with jiu-jitsu you you look around and if there's some and you, you generally say hello to everyone who's in the building anyway that's and you know you see someone who's new and you introduce yourself and you welcome it's a it's a very welcoming thing to do and i think it's the community of people in jiu-jitsu we've all been bad at it no one's mm. good and what you've done is just become less bad by turning up more mm. and that gets the social element so when you see someone new come in you want to give them the gift that you've received by progressing through jiu-jitsu because it is a gift and so you want to give them that gift of making it as soft as possible and you remember your first day and you remember the time you tap and you remember that you used to get so scared and claustrophobic that you would tap and submit not from position not from submission but just out of exhaustion and fear and we've all had that and it's you hold that as a shame and then as you develop technique and you sort of understand a little bit more you only tap when you're in definitely in in a in a bad position and someone is is obviously in a dominant position and so that's a, a submission so there's something about someone new coming in that you want to share that now in 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 kickboxing and 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 boxing and we run safe programs and all of those it's usually the difference they see someone new as an easy spa like, yeah. oh yes give me that guy Fuck him right? up. Boom, yeah. boom 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 and i'm going to feel amazing and then when a coach looks i'm going to duck this i'm going to hit a body shot and then i'm going to throw a right leg kick and, and i'm going to look amazing because i don't fear this person whereas in jiu-jitsu you don't fear them but you also want to show them and you know deep down you've just got better by showing someone Mm. And all the black belts, the reason they do it is they've tapped more than us. So they've come through the submissions and they've paid their dues on getting in these tough positions. But they've also trained people repetitively on the same in the same move and the same positions. So that training reinforces their learning and then it's just this little snowball effect. Yeah, I find it I find it one of the most rewarding things helping out people that are new and I think a switch came for me probably a few years ago when I, you'd start to think if you're rolling with someone no matter what level they are you think w what are they going to take away from this role mm -hmm. you know if if um say you're say you're more experienced than them if the only thing they're going to take away from this role is you smashing them and sweating all over them that's not good f that's not good for either of you so you no. start to think yeah you still want to be as competitive as you can and and but you want you want to both go away having got something positive which going beyond jujitsu is sort of what we should be doing in every interaction we have you know rather than thinking you know i'm gonna speak to whether it's your your wife or a colleague or whoever it is rather than thinking what do i want from this how am i going to get mm. my way Mm. that's why i asked you about being selfish because i'm not saying you were but i think we all have elements of selfishness and i think something like this where you where you have to give of yourself and suffer a bit working your way through that selfishness and and thinking yeah you you you, you want you don't want to be whether it's jujitsu or it's as i say life or little interactions you don't want to be winning the whole time because then you're an no. arsehole yeah you, know, you want to be you want to be giving as much as you can you want yeah. them you don't want to you don't want to go le necessarily complimenting the point of letting people beat you up and mm -hmm. and and flattering their ego but you want to you want to give them the correct amount of kind of help and encouragement and yeah as i say that sh we should be like that in every human interaction we fail to be like that perhaps a lot but yeah we and i think be. that's a breakdown of community and we've seen this through COVID. Right? We're, we're obviously all affected in different ways through COVID. We had to close our gym for a couple of years. That was brutal for running a business like that. Um, but luckily, you know, the government helps out. and you know, we, we, we have members that kept paying to keep our business alive, which is crucial. Now, 
we look at what we need to do as a business. This is in the, the Elevate Gym. We need to pro provide a safe environment. We need to progress people. For that, you need to push them. You can't just sort of easy training. It doesn't, doesn't work. But to do... To progress someone through pushing, you've got to have this belief. they got to know that, okay, they'll get ranked and they'll be better. And how do they know that? It's because this guy's just a bit better than me. It's not, I'm not going to be that black belt. And so what grows a gym is just all these staggered levels, different body types, different backgrounds. So then when someone new comes in, they serve a purpose because they come in, they're the new one. So the person that was a new one two months ago just went up and everyone just went up. In, in terms of a skills hierarchy. So naturally we, we tell them you gotta train down. And so you don't just get someone new and then boom, tap them out five times and go, yes, I won. That's what happens in boxing and kickboxing. It doesn't happen as much in jujitsu. And when we see it, we grab the guy behind and go, listen, you gotta teach them that, right? So I know you wanna win because you just lost all these, so that's cool. But remember, you gotta be sort of teaching because you remember what it was like. And so there's this progression that if you can stay in jiu-jitsu, do you get your blue belt? That's the, the hardest belt because, you know, you've been training a couple of years and it's pretty brutal. Then you're teaching as well. And that's one of the things, one of the criteria that, that they look for is, you know, are you teaching? Or if you're just trying to go out and go crazy and beat all the, all the newbies, that's not really the ethic that, that, that will get you on the way to jiu-jitsu. It's not about results. It's about the type of person you are and, and, and how you train with others. Maybe that's why you haven't got your black belt yet. Because I'm too selfish. Do you think that's what? It's certainly not for lack of talent. No, I mean, and, and I've definitely got plenty of that. But, exactly. but um, there's, there's something missing. No, but then, then you look at what Reorg's trying to do. We're trying to give the gift to people that need a bit of focus and be, be, need a bit of attention, and they need a community. But also, what Reorg does for gym owners when we come in and and and, and place someone in. We enrich that gym with a special type of person that chose a profession to come and help us, come and help keep us safe no matter what service they were in. I don't think, I think it's probably the, the gym, because I live up the road, and it's probably the first time in my life I can remember having like a real community place mm -hmm. like that. Because I grew up in, you know, in the kind of stockbroker belt, I suppose you'd call it, the kind of like people in detached mm. houses nodding hello to each other and there wasn't much the local pub is probably the yeah and, I, and my and you know yeah if you got into going to the pub there was that but even even there wasn't even that you know it's very sort of middle middle class where i grew up and there wasn't there wasn't you know you'd see like you'd see like soap operas and there'd always be that community center there'd be mm -hmm. like the pub or whatever it is and i didn't really have that growing up you know you'd have mm. you you'd do what you did but there wasn't a kind of center for everyone but living up the road from a gym it's it's it really feels like that because you know it's a small enough town that in that you wherever you go you bump into people and you see people from there and you know you know they're all all right mm. you know they, they don't all yeah, have to yeah. be your closest friends but you know they're all decent people who would look out for you if it came to it yeah and it's just it's a very valuable thing and i remember during the lockdown when the gym was closed bumping into people mm. but, you know we're all in that slight grump you know yeah. uh, hat on over your hair wondering all this bullshit's going to end but one of the things we're already keep the for is keep the gym, keep the gym going yeah. so it's there for when we when we open up again all having to do things you did I was cycling and doing yoga videos at home yeah. and what, you know you do whatever to stop your sanity but it was all towards the end point of having this place where we could go is whenever we got the, yeah. got the chance and just work it you know thrash it out and come back feeling better you know and and yeah you you, you then go into a, a, a tough training environment and really learn a lot about yourself in jiu-jitsu so when we look at what the real structure is sam the founder that obviously royal marine worked at pti a lot and then worked with a lot of people with you know, physical disabilities when they would have issues over in deployment. And then he met Mark Ormrod. You know, we, we both know Mark very well. He's the most inspirational man I've ever met. You know, a guy that's just got one arm, lost lost both legs and, and, and an arm in Afghanistan. His story is remarkable about mental resilience, about, you know, mindset, and just a great guy. So getting to know him and Sam well and getting to use some of my business skills to help 
reorg and, and, and help us help more people. And then rolling jiu-jitsu with Mark Hornrod, who just got his purple belt, is one of the biggest eye-openers I've ever had. And people that listen to this that know jiu-jitsu, they understand you've got to adapt it for your body. Right? I'm not very flexible. I'm not doing the weird sort of you know inverted barambolos. I don't do that. I've got a pretty simple game. Mark hasn't got any legs and he's got one arm. And his game is really quite incredible. I rolled with him a couple of weeks ago. He would do some stuff on top that I've never seen before because he could sort of slide through to the other side without me a chance of catching the legs in, in the guard. And so he gets into this and he does this top side armbar with both stumps either side of my arm. So something you've never felt before. He grabs a gi with his teeth and he, he does some stuff. And you're like, he is the best example of adapting jujitsu to your circumstance. So whether you're old, you're young, you're overweight, you're in peak physical shape, you're the strongest man in the world, or you're that IT person that has never been athletic, everyone can adapt jiu-jitsu to them. And that's the, the big spirit of what Mark's been able to do is spread the gift of jiu-jitsu to people that physically thought they couldn't do it. Because I'm not in shape, I don't do this, I'm not that sort of person. Yes, you can. And the best thing you can do is give that gift to someone else. I've, I've had loads of conversations where you're at kind of boozy corporate events and someone you get talking martial arts comes up and a guy says someone our, our sort of age they'll go oh, I'd like to do that but you know, I've had this knee mm. oh, alright cool here's a picture of a bloke with one leg yep. here's a picture of a bloke with, two, with no legs here's, yep. you, know, and, you know is your knee as bad as not having one probably not exactly um you you'll you'll find a way and yeah you if it's to doing what mark does and having to use your one arm and your head and your teeth to <laughs> but it's even you you, it. you've had some of those conversations and you've coaxed them down for the first time and you've sort of shown them through you've brought people into the gym and then some of them are still there and the biggest thing i always hear the biggest regret in jujitsu i wish i did it earlier I wish I started earlier. I was 30, I was 20, I was 16. I wish I started earlier. Now, if you really dissect that as a human being saying, look, I'm so happy with what this is, I could have used it in previous hardship that I went through. And so when you think of that, you uh, as a martial artist and, and you know, very experienced jujitsu ju practitioner, you're going around giving the gift. You know, well, us with this podcast, we might unlock one person to take that step and go into the martial arts gym and uh, sign up for a jujitsu class and lose because you're going to lose all the time. But if you can persevere, you come out the other end, you're in this community full of people from every walk of life that the focus is delayed gratification, going through hardship, mental resilience, skills transfer, skills uh, allocation, skills just constantly under refinement, then you get to test at 100% each time. Like, there is a big gift on that. And people always ask me, Tom Hardy, right? So, real Tom Hardy, what's Tom like? And I think Tom has given more people that gift of jujitsu than any person I've ever met. He explains it so well. He's, he's a very good training partner. He trains a lot. He recovers fast. He's very humble. And he picks up skills very quickly. And so what he's been able to do uh, and help us with Reorg is, is give us a bigger platform. And so one of the things when you train with Tom, it's, it doesn't matter what he's done before. This guy's got a high profile. This person's got a high profile. This one does. This person he works in an office. None of that matters when you get on the mats because you can't fake it. And what he does really well is coaches people and then brings a lot of people to jiu-jitsu. And certainly with Reorg, that's been the, 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 the over overwhelming amount of people that come and try it for the first time is because seen a spotlight of what Tom sort of posted or, or, or something that Tom did. And then they look at the research and they look at the background of Sam and Mark and then maybe they just contact Re Reorg. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not in a good spot and they're ex-military or they're police. And then Sam, we've got a whole team that worked through with these people and then placed them in a gym. And then they progress through. And if they make it through that first six months, then sometimes you pick up and you amplify their story. And what you're doing is then amplifying the gift out even more. 
Maybe you just got one person from that. Maybe it was a hundred. And then those people then just the spider web sort of develops out. And what that is doing is improving people's lives. There's no doubt about that. So back to the corporate career and being a bit selfish. This is one of the best things I've ever done is trying to help a charity that's going to help people improve their lives. Yeah, and it's giving... Well, I can't remember the exact quote, but someone someone said something about how anyone who's not been any... any I think it was any man, but who's not been in the military will always have part of his life missing. And I think that is, there is a need for people to go and do something sort of difficult and fighty. And I'm not comparing rolling around on a mat to being on the front line in Afghanistan, but it's it's a sort of window into the same part of your mind i think if i could put it like that and it's and it's a it's a place where people someone who can't understand what it's like to not have gone through that and someone who can't understand what it's like to have gone through you mm. know being shot at and well, stuff. it's, fear, it's, a, it's it? a common it's a common ground and it's a, and it's a bit of the same thing they can understand us and we can understand them through mm -hmm. this kind of medium through this thing well and it's it fear because no matter what the circumstance, the, 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 the common issue is fear. And in jiu-jitsu, you will get scared. There will be moments where you, I just, I've got to make it stop. And you can time. forget that now because we've been doing it a long time because you, 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 your heart rate's pretty low when you start now, isn't it? It's not. Yeah, only not, tournaments. Not, yeah. When I do tournaments, I still fear that fear. But even that goes, I think. Yep, you get better, less fear. Yeah, because the more you do it, the more. Because yep. you, you forget that actually just stepping on the mat in a gym, the first time you've done it, you're a bit like, oh, this is what's going to ha happen here. Yeah. And you're kind of nervous. Now it's a totally relaxing thing to do. Yeah. And I guess there are even people who find being shot no, being shot at's probably a bit different, but you know, they'll you, you, shot by getting the guns at, by, by getting the guns out you've you've maybe totally lose my my um, Well these guns aren't really primed at the moment. Oh you don't you don't, don't need to worry about it. Um Oh yeah, it was the US Special Forces guy, Alan Shibaro, who runs the, yeah, the you US him, version right? and, and uh he said he you know, because you look at him and you think it's sort of super tough guy. He's not going to be scared of anything. He said he was terrified in his first first deployment. And, you know, he was, you know, he was already special forces soldier. He'd gone through all the training and everything. But first time out, he said he froze. And it was only the more senior guys who were like pissing about and mm. cracking jokes because they'd done it before and they realised the best way through is to have a bit of a laugh with it because people are shooting oh, ping, bullets pinging off you and he said something in his mind just switched and he's like fuck it yeah just, just get, get on get on with it there's no t there's no time for this yeah it's it's hard for us to realize and 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 just meeting more people in the military and meeting more police and, and that's something that's been an eye opener and we've got a lot of ambulance uh people involved reorg and the fire brigade but the police have got a tough job and they need jujitsu more than any single skill because you've got to be comfortable close quarters or else you're going to reach for something and then things will escalate and i think that's the big uh focus that that we've been able to put for real it back into the police to try to get people to progress it up to their station and then their regional people and, and, and make sure that people are given the opportunity to learn jiu-jitsu during basic training and, 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 and as they progress through, through, through the police journey. Because you know yourself, like, when we used to kickbox, you'd always think, oh, if there's any trouble, man, I'll just drop this guy to the left hook or I might just hit him to the body and I'll be fine. There's a chance he's going to fall back, hit his head, and then we've got ourselves a real issue. Whereas jiu-jitsu, you just sort of just grab him. You just grab him, just, just mm. give him a little hug. Just go, you're not going anywhere, right? So so just just calm down, just be cool. Then you let him go and they might swing again. If you grab him again, then this time maybe a little choke. Just go, listen, mate, we've got to stop this. Right. And there's some, you're introducing a fear into that guy more so than maybe a stand-up fight. And you know they teach them nothing in the police. Very little. Like, yeah. I, Unfortunately. I had a police police officer on and they're always they always want to be polite same as the military guys they don't want to particularly if they're serving but they don't want to slag off their unit or their or and but reading between the lines and speaking to them afterwards they basically they've got some old self-defense video from from the 60s where you know it's sort of this where you do some sort of arm lock on someone that doesn't work and 
as you also know, you need to do things a thousand times until and, until you can sure. use them under under duress. And they do this like, right, do this, do this, right, next. So they basically send them out with pass ze- mark. Yeah, they yeah, send them the out with zero. Yeah. Um, pretty, you know, all, to all intents and purposes, zero martial arts and then because of that i think they deep down they know it so there's an anxiety as a police officer you're going to get in trouble or you're going to you know find yourself without backup and 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 then in a hand-to-hand issue and luckily in this country police officers don't have guns right so we see this in in the u.s and other countries where loads of police shootings you know you can't prove it but you think if that police officer had a little bit more confidence in this situation they could have possibly diffused it and you know the, the gracie breakdown of all the henner and here on gracie always breaking down a lot of the police sort of it, uh, incidents and look we could have probably done this a little bit better so i think people are rising up to it as a uh, self-defense form and 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 obviously everything we do with real plays a small part but all of the people trying to progress uh, in their own jiu-jitsu journey, uh, in their own jiu-jitsu journeys, they go around and try to bring people to the gym. Mm-hmm. And it's not because they want to win; it's because they want to give that gift. And it's something quite remarkable. Um, yeah, I think it's worth saying as well that I, I say to people when they're new as well, I say jiu-jitsu is not for everyone, right? No. So, so you say in a couple of weeks, either you're going to hate this and never want to do it again, or you're going to start feeling yourself being hooked. But, and, and Reorg does this as well because it's not solely jiu-jitsu anymore, you can do something else, you know, if it's CrossFit or cycling, you can do something else which changes the blood, I call it. You know, you go in and you feel completely different because mm-hmm. you kind of exhausted yourself. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be, you know, rolling around wrestling for everybody. You just need to find something. What we, as, as kids, you would go out and get pissed and hey and that sort of does the same thing because you wake up the next day you're in a totally different place and you've blown off steam unfortunately it's not a viable long-term solution and it's a a depressant as a drug exactly so it's 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 great it's great when you do it during exactly during but it's taken away and then you know you can you can amplify that if you go on and try some even more relaxing things and sort of hit the class a's and stuff yeah the 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 sort of good and the backlash to bad is just all the more well, violent you know? and when you're looking at it we're, we're all trying to change state in some way because being normal human all the time there's a lot of anxiety there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of you know as you get older you, you have more responsibility be it family um and so there's a desire to change state so you know, there's yoga practices that do that. There's alcohol does that. Recreational drugs do that. Hard training does that. Whether it be CrossFit, whether it be running for a marathon, whether it be you're just a Saturday footballer, but you train three times a week until you can't run anymore. Whether it be you're lifting weights and you're you're, you're a powerlifter and you want to get that PB. Pushing yourself in uncomfortable situations is essential in terms of growing as a person. And ultimately improving your life it's as simple as that and and so my journey from corporate success to then getting cancer and then focusing everything on natural health improvements so the bioscience we're looking at curcumin so heavy my gym we're looking at martial arts so heavy my charity trying to bring so many people into martial arts the whole thing is we're trying to do all of that without any real natural well, with so, so the whole thing we're trying to do all of that without alcohol and drugs and all of this stuff, trying to get the human body optimized using plants for solutions for pain and inflammation and stiffness and mobility, but then also using exercise as a way of therapy, as a way of pushing you further so you don't have the anxiety, you don't feel so claustrophobic and so sort of stressed in everyday life and a big part of some of the issues in covid was that isolation for people so not just you know socially the rise in zoom just took off and and google meets and even your grandparents are are doing facetime that was good but there's something about that human interaction and certainly martial arts and jujitsu is very intimate so you're holding someone very close and trying to take their back I think there's an element that's lost in today's society with uh, with that human interaction. 
Yeah, sometimes too intimate for people. And this is what you say to new yeah. people, who like sometimes there'll be someone sitting on your head. And I remember being new thinking, this can't be right. This mm-hmm. can't be this can't be what we're supposed to do. But yeah. you know, you get you, you you get used to that. And I think it makes you much more tolerant of kind of other people you know yeah. other people in, in your face because and, you're you're used to it and well, that's this, what, first... this, what this copper said was a lot a lot of people have never in their life been grabbed no not maybe they've not had a sibling who's roughed them up maybe they've you know mm. they just so they'll they turn up become a policeman and the first time they're grabbed it's by some big drunk bloke on the street they quite rightly Freeze. panic yeah yeah so 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 look look at that look at us as a culture now i think we're understanding nutrition better the food pyramids out everyone sort of understands a little bit about that when we're looking at physical activity like owning a gym we get more people with wearable tech looking at heart rates and you know understanding that i push into the red zone the longer i stay there the better it is for my cardiac health then they're looking at recovery agents so you know we've done curcumin to 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 use then other people different protein powders or, or or different sort of ways of doing it and then you're seeing a reduction in alcohol in these cohorts of people because they know if they go out and get hammered they can't train the next day they don't feel that well the sleep's messed up any of their wearable tech will show you how bad their sleep is so we're finding a rise in 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 a certain type of people where they are looking to improve their longevity, improve their health, improve their mental health through hardship, through training hard or, or a skill or a martial art or having a goal. It used to be different. People used to just think diets and then I'll go to the gym and they go on a treadmill and they run, maybe walk, maybe lift some weights by themselves with their ear pods in. We see that in our gym. They don't last long. And I feel sorry for them. We're trying to coax them onto the mat because you need a skill to actually progress and you need a skill to really make you turn up. And then you need the community of people that you want to go because of that social interaction. And what we're starting to find then is the people that learn martial arts and stay in, we all rise together. We all get much better shape we all understand cardiac health we all understand longevity we all understand the hardship needed and so then you get this sort of class of people that a look at the research and constantly try to improve themselves but b they know they're going to go in and face hardship but it's for the common good whereas the average person can't do that they can't train hard. It feels like, oh, I need to stop. You do a lot of breath work. So trying to get to that point where you can't breathe and then going longer, average person can't do that. It's horrible. It's this is feeling, this, 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 this tension, this fear. But then you progress through it and then you go, okay, it's the power of the brain. It's the mindset. I can control my breath. I can control my reactions. I can control what I do every day through the power of the brain. Yeah, because you've got those, your your defence mechanisms are there for a good reason, but I think if, at one breakthrough for me is realising when they're not your friend, mm. right? So, so you know, you see this, in, you can see this in simple terms of your stretching, you know, your, 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 your nervous system is trying to stop you ripping your joints out. So, so you get towards what you think is your end goal and you get that and you start to you start, your body starts to tense up and it won't allow you to do it so mm. so this set, being stiff like that is a consequence of an overactive overprotective because you know you're you, i'm i'm a grown up now i want to make my decision i know i'm doing something healthy but my body's stopping me so it's when mm. it's then it's not your friend and you need to try and as gently as you can remove it from the equation so you know so you 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 know you know you're doing the right thing it's okay it's okay to stretch my legs to this point and if I if I hover on the edge of where that pain is, this is what the yin yoga takes you into finding finding the edge. So you find that mm. pain, and you're just going into it enough. Mm-hmm. So it's not gonna it's not gonna alarm your body into spasming, but you're just going into enough, and and then you leave it there until it settles. You take it a bit further, and you leave it there until it settles. And if it takes, and if you have to be five ten minutes in one stretch, you do it, and eventually your body will give up, and you go, oh, it's safe now. Mm. It's like it's like putting the dog back to sleep. You know, it's safe now. You're all right. You're another no no problem here. And then your body relaxes, and suddenly you find yourself doing things you couldn't do before. But you have to be slow with it. You know, you can't. Yeah, and and you've got to know it will be better for you. 
that's the hard part. So when I go to you the, know you mean knowing you're doing the right thing. Yes, yeah. and knowing that this is going to be worth it. Because mm -hmm. what you don't want to do, the natural thing is, okay, I extend my arm here, it's painful, here it's painful. I don't want to keep extending it because this is of no value. But if it's a if it's a joint or if it's a, a lot of time posture or if it's something like that and just breathing into it, knowing that that means I'm going to be a wider range of motion, the muscles, that means I'm unlocking you know, the way my body moves and, and, and I have a functional fitness gain. But even some of the stuff you're doing, I've, I've watched you over the years we've trained where you, I think I took you to the first hot yoga class and uh, I hated, took you to... Hated it. Yeah, and I took you so I had someone that was worse than me in there. And then you progressed past me and now you're basically a yogi. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, the language of yoga prevents me from talking about being good at it because we don't, <laughs> we're not good at yoga, you no. know, because you can't tell. But yeah, I've made, I've made great progress in that, yeah, my body comple moves completely differently to how it did. I mean, I have to say, from, a, uh, from not from a great start, I was really stiff when I started. Part of it, part of what's helped me, my progress is looking at my son because he's nine now and I look at how how sort of effort effortlessly bendy his limbs are and i'm thinking okay i'm just older than him you know i haven't like I, all i've mm. done is grown older and become stiffer and move mm. less because we do this year by year we get most people and there's i start no, and, and um, there's been no physical change it's just like yeah it's just it's just i'm just slowly you know tensing up and you look you look at people a lot older than me and it's if you carry on down that path i start to see it as basically you get stiffer and stiffer and stiffer and stiffer until you're an old person that can barely move and then you die. This is the way I see it. And, and you can look at that progress of life. All, all bendy limbed and free. By the time you're in your 40s, you're much more kind of stationary. And, st and if, you haven't, if you haven't addressed it, if you haven't done... So well, you could just do what my son does and play around, but that's not really an option. Mm. for that. Where, you know, where do you sign up for that class? So you have to go and do yoga or something like that. And it's just get it. It's not like, you know, I can pretty much do the splits now. And people would say, oh, that's, you know, taken a lot of work to get there. And, and yes, it has, but you're really just undoing the years of sort of ossification that your body mm. goes through as you kind of get stiffer and stiffer. And I just thought, I want to, as much as possible, keep hold of or, or regain and then keep hold of that kind of looseness of limb that that I watch my boy having and he, he tries to tell me he goes he tries to tell me how to do that and I'm like mm. sorry I, this is where I draw the line you don't know anymore about you've just got this you're just naturally like you that do this. You, can't te you can't teach me yeah so yeah it's, it, and then that has been a because I'd been doing jiu-jitsu for a few years and wasn't really addressing that mobility mm -hmm. issue and I could see it not ending well because mm. if you're if you are st super stiff and you try and do athletic things sooner or later something's got to get going to get yeah or your recovery is just too long so you can't progressively do it but you you after class you used to go get the parallettes and then what's richard doing over there what and you then doing? started doing handstands and handstand push-ups and a lot of isometric stuff so you put in the time but did you ever have the goal of i want to do the splits in in my late 40s not no and to, and to be honest doing the splits isn't a particular goal of mine what what i um what i want is the way i sell it to people it's not about doing impressive things it's about how you feel when you're sitting here like this mm -hmm. yeah you know, you, because day-to-day so -day posture yeah you know, so you comfort. it's a thing where you know you're sitting at your laptop which often we don't do in a particularly healthy way mm -hmm. it changes how you do that and and you're because you're always you're always wanting to put your body in good positions and you know that thing about mul you know the myth of multitasking right you know mul people talk about multitasking and then and it's been proved in studies you can't really multitask you can do two things badly yeah or you can do this for a bit and this for a bit and this for a bit but more likely you're you're doing both. this is deep work both the, the book so, deep work really goes into this oh yeah i yeah. haven't read it but but you know you understand that that intellectually mm. you can't multitask mm. you should and you shouldn't you shouldn't um you shouldn't kid yourself you should do this and finish and then do that and then do things one at a time the exception to that is what you can do with your posture so mm. you can sit you can sit fully concentrating on a document whatever it is you're doing but you put your body 
into a, you know so you put one knee across here and you put your body into a into a good into a good posture po possibly as i said stretching one side by putting a knee up and then when it gets mm -hmm. tired switching legs you can do that and not not only can you multitask like that but it will help you yeah, because yeah, you get yeah. yourself into the position you think so right, that's why you're working on doing while you're working yeah. so that because you get yourself in a good position and then you fully immerse yourself in what you're doing and you'll have a kind you'll probably after five or ten minutes depending you will probably get a slight tweak okay that's long yeah. enough but then you probably need to put it, bring your eyes up for the dog, and then you go back in and you go on to the other side so yeah mm. multitasking is a myth but you can certainly do something watch tv even, even but make sure you're in a you're in a in a position that's doing you good mm. but as soon as you slump well and i think we all know that and we all look at the older people and one of the the things that i've got in common with my business partner dr harry is we want to live better than our parents and that's not to say my parents are bad but it's like okay we've now got more data about the right foods more data about the right supplements more data about the correct training so if you did everything the same that your parents did, which is usually what happens with, with conditioning, you'll get the same result. But we want to age differently. We want to live differently. And that's a common goal that seems to be happening in certainly London and in, in, in parts of Sydney and all around the world where there's this collection of people that are looking to change things up. So whether it be the rise in yoga, the rise in jiu-jitsu, the rise in wearable tech and understanding heart rates, the rise in focus on nutrition and all these diets and intermittent fasting, whether it's be supplementation, whether it, whatever it is, there's this constant goal to live differently. And that is key to all of this because living differently means trying something new and then progressing at it to the point of, yep, yeah, okay, I've given this a good shot whether it be your breath work, whether it be yoga, whether it be the multitasking. So to hear it, I'm going, yeah, I'm going to do that. The big challenge is doing it and then doing it long enough to feel the benefits. And that's jujitsu, six months plus of, you know, hard work before you'll start seeing that you've just progressed somewhere. That's work life. That's, you know, nutrition, all these little things you've got to do. You've got to give it a, a good go. But for us, we're just encapsulating it all in this we've got to live differently mm. to get a different result yeah you're right about the long term but also i the way i ever get get over any kind of barriers to training is i just think how am i going to feel tomorrow how am i going to feel when i wake up tomorrow especially and the and days you don't want to go so you tonight know, would i be happy i went or not that if i get to that mindset i'll always go also how's your how's your dinner going to taste you know you sit yeah. down to a big plate of food how different it tastes if you've if you've pushed yourself that day well we, we had the day where you're forcing down you go on holiday a big plate of food and you've not really earned it you're kind of i'll eat it through greed but it's not the same the feeling when you've you know mm. you've earned your food well, and you've pushed it, yourself I, I had this recently so we did our second rollathon with with reorg um and so that's 24 hours we have someone continually on the mats in all these academies around the world to further the reorg mission and and to uh to, to cr create awareness now, this year, my strategy was different. Last year, I did 45-minute sparring sessions, staged throughout the, the days, and you know, some people are doing technique. We're, we're just like, no, we're going to spar. So this year, I said, all right, I'll, I'll go early. on the first day. I'll just do technique and go a little bit lighter. My first role was the black belt Gareth from Tatami. This dude's really good and long-standing jiu-jitsu guy big in the community over here polaris uh various things and he's got such a tricky game so i'm in a tough five minutes boom then someone's going to continually roll there's a few of us on the mats and the others had to go so i'm going to stay on the mat now with gareth i think i had six five minute rounds with him just constantly until someone else could come and take over so the first hour of my Rollathon strategy just changed dramatically. I've just gone full on with a really good black belt, learn a lot, had some, had some great roles. Then I go over to the gym and then get into class and, and coach Tommy, our, our coach and, and my business partner. He only knows one way and that's hard. And so boom, I'm in rolling with him and then a few of the others. So the first two hours I've undone my whole strategy. I'm already locked in, I'm already sort of tired, I recovered for a little bit. Then that evening, uh, C4, which really helps us with reorg, brought a few guys down to 
be part of the role thon. One of them was Bobby Rich, so a Roger Black Belt, extensive judo uh, background, great guy. And so I hadn't rolled with him before. And then I was like, oh, I'm already sore. I'm already this is my second time. And, and boom, we had a couple of really good rolls. And then I'm rolling with a few other people. And I ended up doing 20 that first day. The goal was 15, and then I was going to do you know, 20, 25 the next day. And then get to the gym in the morning. I'm so tired. I'm so sore. I did what I said I wasn't going to be. But what got me there was this whole, okay, reorg mission. I've got to help it. Sam and Mark started, and they've driven down from Inverness, and they're stopping, and they're going full 24 hours. These guys over here are doing 24 hours. It got me to go in the gym when I'm sore, and I don't want to do it. And I loved it when I was in there. And at the end of it, I didn't quite hit hit the target, but I, I got a lot of good roles in and just the camaraderie about it all. And there was something about that. The next day, I could hardly move, right? It's just one of those things that you put yourself through it. And I look at that. I had a chat with Mark Ormrod. Here he goes, 24 hours. Sam, 24 hours. We're releasing a big video to, to, to show this. And it's something where community gets you through it. It's something where there's this shared sort of focus on trying to improve your health trying to create awareness and do something you don't want to do and ultimately that's you know better for you when it's good for you right man that's awesome we've, we've blown through our time chatting Perfect. awesome but it's been awesome great to talk to you Trent yes Scanlon. richard always a pleasure thank you for your help with reorg and 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 certainly sharing our mission and thank you for your help with my jiu-jitsu mate always well it. it's always helps both ways that's always a pleasure thank you sir thanks richard nice work